Grab your headphones and some wine Don't be scared now, you'll be Welcome to Weird Things and Wine, the show where we sip wine and talk about all things weird. My name is Tash. And my name is Mia. And today, we will be talking about D.B. Cooper. Shall we jump right into it? Yes, please. (laughs) Cheers. Cheers. The 1950s to the 1970s is often regarded as the golden age of air travel. Imagine a luxurious lounge filled with all sorts of displays of finery and wealth. Ladies adorned with silk gloves and strings of pearls, accompanied by gentlemen in their fortune, specifically those willing to do anything to get it. So enters Dan Cooper, a man who has been remembered in infamy for his attempted, and potentially successful, skyjacking. His case still has people talking over 50 years later, and is regarded as one of the most intriguing mysteries that has never been solved. Let's talk about D.B. Cooper. Wow. Okay, if you hear my cat crying, he's just talkative and 17, so we let him talk. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a lot to say. <laughs> He's the ambiance for today. <laughs> also, let the record show. We're actually drinking wine today. We Not a cocktail. <laughs> We're actually weird things and wine. <laughs> for like the first time in a long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, we're so good at things. <laughs> Mia, I have a question. Yes. Because I know that you do a lot of flying in your life. Oh, Lots yes. of airplane flying at least. Mm-hmm. Do you like flying? That's a good question. My answer has definitely changed over the years. Okay. As of lately, it's maybe not my favorite thing to do. Mm. <laughs> but that's a good question. My answer has definitely changed over the years. Okay. As of lately, it's maybe not my favorite thing to mm. do. <laughs> but there are part there are like aspects of flying that I like and don't like also at the same time. Mm, like what? Like turbulence. Oh my god. Like gosh. turbulence is fun in the moment. But the idea of impending doom, not so fun. <laughs> not so, so fun. <laughs> it's very double-edged. <laughs> Have you heard about the jello theory? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So apparently when a plane is going through turbulence, it's like it's in jello and the jello is shaking, but it's not going to fall through the jello. So basically the air is jello and the plane is in the jello. That's a great theory. Yeah, and it makes you feel a little better because it's like you're not just gonna jump out of Jello. You're okay. okay. That's fair. I've watched way too many like plane crash documentaries. Was as a young child, but <laughs> as a child, it's so fun. It was so much fun. It was like my favorite thing to when the takeoff happens and the like G forces on you push you back. Mm. As a young child, you can't like hold yourself up. <laughs> So you would, like, hold for as long as you can and then just finally give in. Oh, my gosh. What a blast. <laughs> now it's not so fun. No. Now no. it's more Now it's more like white-knuckled on the seat. Like, <laughs> if something's going to go wrong, it's going to happen now. It's going to happen within the next two minutes. Please, can we just get up into air and have the seatbelt tent turned off, and then we'll be okay. <laughs> Do you like flying? I get really anxious about it, even though I, I'm not, like, too worried about crashing. I just, I get claustrophobic. Oh, that's not great. Like, the first time I was ever on an airplane for, like, seriously on an airplane that I can remember, I was on, like, a 12-hour flight, and, like, halfway through, I was like, okay, I am ready to skydive. (laughs) Give me a parachute, and I will jump out of here right now. That's fair. awful. There's no escaping. There's no escaping, and then eventually you realize we're all breathing the same air, and it's been 12 hours, and now I'm breathing someone else's air. Yeah. Not good. That's not the most favorite fact no i'm not really too worried about the actual in the plane type of or in the sky type of stuff it's more the other people i don't like okay yeah wow okay together like we can do this together we can do this (laughs) you're fine being in a plane and i'm fine being in the sky (laughs) we'll be okay (laughs) so let's talk about the hijacking So, on November 24th, 1971, a man known only as D.B. Cooper, or Dan Cooper, bought a one-way plane ticket from Portland, Oregon to Seattle, Washington. So, he bought this ticket with cash, $20. Can you believe a flight cost $20? No. Honestly, no. That's crazy. So, he showed up at the airport, gave them the name Dan Cooper. They didn't... So, he showed up at the airport, gave them the name Dan Cooper. They didn't need ID back then, and bought the flight with cash. 
and he carried only a black briefcase and a paper bag that was 4 inches tall, 12 inches wide, and 14 inches long. He was described as a white male in his mid-40s. Cooper was dressed as a businessman, wearing a raincoat over his suit and tie. He was one of 42 people aboard Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 305, which was a Boeing 727, six of which were the crew members. So it wasn't a very big flight, or at least not like a populated flight. The flight actually could carry 106 passengers. So that's like less than half. Yeah. I don't know why, but I found that odd. Just because, so like, my mom had been flying during that time. She started flying with her parents and she was very young. And from all the stories that she's told me, like all of the flights that she's been on, none of them have really ever been like, (laughs) to have had as little people on it as this flight. Yeah, I feel like when you, yeah, I feel like when you get on a flight, you know it's gonna be like you're brushing shoulders with strangers the whole time. It's like never not packed. And especially cause like, how can you even make money on a flight if you have less than half capacity. Yeah. Especially you know? back then. Yeah. I don't know what $20. I feel that'd be about $100 nowadays. Which is still cheap for a flight. Yeah. At any rate, it's cheap for a flight. <laughs> yeah. And back then, of course, there was no, like, security. You don't need to, like, get your bags checked or anything. No. Which is also crazy. Yeah. So, Cooper was seated near the last row, and it's debated what, which seat exactly he sat in. Mm-hmm. So it could have been 18E, it could have been any number of other ones. Yeah. It varies. But it was near the last row, near the back of the airplane. And he asked a flight attendant for a bourbon and soda and was smoking cigarettes basically the whole time. I think he smoked eight, Mm -hmm. eight Mm -hmm. around in total, which was pretty normal for the time, 1970s. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to drink and you're going to have a cigarette on a plane. Which is crazy, again. Also, yes. <laughs> I can't imagine being on an airplane and having someone smoke beside me. Especially as a non-smoker. Mm-hmm. That would just be, like, a nightmare. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Flight 305, so the model is a Boeing 727, which was introduced in 1963. So, like, not too far before this whole thing happened, this plane was introduced into, or it was um, put into service. And really interestingly... <laughs> They had to make a change after 1971 to this plane because Mm. of this incident. (laughs) Right, yeah. So um, just because we're talking about the plane, I will describe one of the most distinct features of the plane, which is that its entrance and exit point was something called... Which is that its entrance and exit point was something called an air stair, which we... I have never seen before. (laughs) In my whole life, (laughs) Um, which is located at the back of the plane, and it's just a staircase that can be lowered, as opposed to, like, normal planes today have an exit point near the front of the plane where they have to bring a separate staircase to the plane for you to get out. But this one was built in. As I mentioned previously, after 1971, they added something called a Cooper vane, um, also known as the Dan Cooper switch or the DB Cooper device. Which is essentially a mechanism that, when in flight, uses airflow to move um, something under the door, and the airflow keeps the door from being able to be opened in flight. Or the air stair, not the door. (laughs) Which is really nice, because that's reassuring. They should have had that before. Yeah, I can't believe that they didn't have that before. Like, oh, who's gonna jump out of a plane? (laughs) That's crazy. On to more about the... Flight 305's plane, there were six crew members in total. There was a Captain William Scott, First Officer Bob Ratazak. Sorry. There was a Flight Engineer um, H.E. Anderson, and there were two flight attendants, Tina Mucklow and Florence Schaffner. Also, this is not important or at all relevant to this case, but flight engineers really neat things that they had to have back in the day and flight engineers had to be so trained just like pilots and they worked together in sync because the flight engineer was in charge of reading all the instruments and inputting anything that the pilots needed like we're gonna go up so we need more fuel okay i'll input the fuel that we need they're also in charge of doing pre-flight and post-flight checks and need more fuel okay i'll input the fuel that we need They're also in charge of doing pre-flight and post-flight checks and um, calculating the weights. Like, they were in charge of, like, all the mechanical systems on a plane. That's so cool. I didn't know that. 
It's like a lot. <laughs> That's really cool. And it's really sad because you don't see them really anymore. No. Computers. It's computers, man. Yeah. AI is taking over everyone's job. Kind of. <laughs> if you're curious about what the stairs look like, there's a really mm. cute animation on the Wikipedia page. Where you can see, like, the door open in the back of the airplane and Cooper, like, jump out. <laughs> it's, like, a little stick figure. It's cute. Check it Thanks, out. Wikipedia. <laughs> okay, so the flight left Portland at 2.50 the day before Thanksgiving and was scheduled to arrive in Seattle just 30 minutes later. Just after takeoff, Cooper handed a note to flight attendant Florence Schaffner, who was sitting in the seat behind her, which was not an uncommon thing for flight attendants at the time. Mm-hmm. So it happened to her a lot, so she just assumed that it was his number and didn't look at it. That's when Cooper whispered, Miss, you better look at that note. I have a bomb. Casual. Casual. <laughs> he was like, okay, well, now this is awkward. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now I have to tell her. Mm-hmm. Sure enough, Florence opened the paper and saw written in capital letters, Miss, I have a bomb in my briefcase and I want you to sit by me. She promptly did as instructed and requested to see it. When Cooper opened his briefcase to reveal this bomb, she saw what inside what she assumed was dynamite, wires, and a battery. Cooper then proceeded to give her a short list of demands, $200,000 in American money, almost $1.5 million today, as well as two back and two front parachutes. He requested that she go and tell the pilot this so he could relay it to the air control on the ground. So she did. She related to Captain William A. Scott, who contacted ground control in Minnesota. That she go and tell the pilot this so he could relay it to the air control on the ground. So she did. She related to Captain William A. Scott, who contacted ground control in Minnesota, which they were flying over at the time. Also, at this point, there was like, um, from what I understood, a pretty, uh, like a fairly quick succession of phone calls. So the pilot contacted ground control. Ground control contacted the police, police, the FBI, the FBI, the airline president, Donald Nyrop. Nyrop? Sorry. And also at this time, the FBI were asking the president, the airline president, <laughs> what he wanted to do in the situation. Specifically, do you want us to comply? How do we, what, what should we do? Um, and he said to comply. Right, because at this time, it was kind of left up to the airlines how they dealt with their airline business. Whereas nowadays, it would be like, he shouldn't be able to make that choice. There's 42 people on board. So the crew then informed the passengers that there would be a delay in their landing in Seattle due to a minor technical difficulty. Mm-hmm. So at this point, nobody on the airplane knew what was going on. It actually doesn't sound like literally the whole time, none of the passengers knew what was going on. Like no. they got off like clueless. Yeah, they didn't know until people started, like, interviewing them. Yeah, which is crazy. (laughs) So yeah, like you said, Northwest Orient Airlines agreed to the demands, and the flight remained in air circling Seattle for two hours in order to give the FBI time to gather the money. In addition to the money, he also asked for two sets of parachutes. Part of the reason I think that they complied is because they kind of thought that he was asking for two sets of parachutes because he was going to take hostage with him, Mm -hmm. which kind of ensured that they couldn't mess with the the parachutes Mm because they could put someone's life in danger so it was basically his waiting for two sets of parachutes because he was going to take hostage with him Mm -hmm. which kind of ensured that they couldn't mess with the the parachutes Mm because they could put someone's life in danger so it was basically his way of ensuring that they didn't you know tamper with them so that they would still open while he was flying through the air also when he asked for the two hundred thousand dollars he specified that it needed to be in 20s with random serial numbers yes And he asked for it specifically to be an American currency, which is interesting. Yes. Yes. I also heard that that detail, the FBI, or maybe not, someone official (laughs) is not positive whether the pilot added American currency or whether Dan himself said American currency. I feel like it's a weird detail for either of them to say, but especially the pilot, because, like, why wouldn't it be American currency? That's true. They're in America. Yeah, right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So it's a weird detail. And parachutes. And not military parachutes. And there is a difference. Apparently, I don't, I'm not sure why this makes sense, but military parachutes are, like, more dome-like, and you can't steer them. They're more so made, I, from my understanding, to be, like, a discreet thing to just transport a human from the air to the ground 
rest of William parachutes you can steer and they're more of a, like a glider shape as opposed to a dome. And they had um, like an easy pull system, which was different than military parachutes perhaps. In the end though, um, I don't believe that he got what he was asking for with these parachutes. No, I don't believe at least that they were steerable. No. No. It's actually so odd, which maybe we'll like get into it when we get there. But like, it's odd. What happened? It is odd what happened. That's why we're talking about this. You're right. <laughs> that is a clip right there. Thank you. <laughs> Not nervous at all and familiar with the local area as he kept pointing out landmarks. Specifically, he pointed out, I think it was a military base. He was like, oh, we must not be far from Seattle Airport because this is close by. Interesting. So it's an interesting thing for him to point out because, like, how would you know how close the the base is to the airport? Yeah, your average civilian would not know that. No. Especially from the sky, right? Mm. Like, how no kidding. would you know? In fact, Tina felt at ease enough to ask him why he was doing this, to which he responded that he had no grudge against the airline. It was just because he had a grudge. Interesting. What does it mean? What does it mean? <laughs> um, making polite conversation, he even asked her where she was from and remarked how nice her home state of Minnesota was. But when she asked where he was from, he became visibly upset and wouldn't answer. <laughs> oh no. He then changed the subject by offering her a cigarette, which she accepted even though she had quit smoking. I can't blame her though. Could Honestly, you imagine? <laughs> subject by offering her a cigarette, which she accepted even though she had quit smoking. I can't blame her though. Could you Honestly, imagine? Ooh, it's something. Yeah. Um, I also heard that so during the time that they were talking, he kept one hand on either the briefcase or the trigger point of the bomb. So while he was smoking, she had to light his cigarette for him because mm -hmm. he would not move his hand. Right. Mm -hmm. At around 545, the flight landed at Seattle Tacoma Airport. Tina exited the plane through the front and returned with the ransom, and only then did Cooper agree to let the passengers go. As he counted the money, Tina jokingly asked for some, which she promptly obliged. <laughs> and she didn't accept it, as tips were against company policy. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is ridiculous. <laughs> this is not the first time that he offered anyone money. He offered, I think, all the flight attendants at some point money, and they all turned it down. I've not heard that! Yeah. Oh my gosh! He's what is his deal? I don't get it. Also, at some point, possibly ordered another bourbon and paid for it in cash. Also, like mm. on the flight after they'd found out about the bomb. Yes. He ordered another one and was like, Oh, thank you. I will pay you. And Even it, though I'm threatening to blow you up. Here's <laughs> some money. I'm a good person. <laughs> he has a very interesting moral code. <laughs> I think that he didn't finish this one. I think he might have spilled it and not asked for another one. Oh. Which is interesting, because mm. it just tells you something about who he is. He doesn't need it. He just wanted it. He did let flight attendants Alice Hancock and Florence Schaffner go, but requested that Tina Mucklow mm. stay behind. So when Tina asked if Cooper would be needing instructions for the parachutes, he declined, as if he already knew how to use them. I did hear um, that, so after they did the exchange with the people for the things, that they had ac they hadn't realized that they'd brought the wrong parachutes or something like that. Mm -hmm. Realized that they'd brought the wrong parachutes or something like that. Mm -hmm. As in they'd brought military parachutes when he'd asked for civilian and they and he made them go and get him some civilian parachutes, which caused a little bit of an extra delay. And he mm -hmm. also demanded that they refuel. He m demanded so like when they were up in the air, he also was like, "Have a fueling truck ready." So Cooper did cut open one of the bags to use it as to carry the, for carrying the money um, because I think he requested a knapsack and they didn't give him one so he just cut it open and used one of them to carry the money so casual and an interesting fact to consider is that all the bills were in $20 denominations mm -hmm. which is heavier than $100 right because mm -hmm. more bills mm -hmm. so that would also affect how big the bag needed to be and how much he weighed jumping out of the airplane I don't know how much exactly it would weigh I think it's something like 21 pounds. Okay, so not like a small. No, it's like enough to make it to make a noticeable dif to make a noticeable difference. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, enough to be kind of cumbersome. It makes sense with the why he asked for it, because a hundred dollar bills would have been suspicious. Yeah, especially in the 70s. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Twenty dollar bills were more passable. Yeah. So since he did cut open the one bag to carry the money, he must have assumed that the other ones were going to be totally fine. And at this point, like you said, the plane was being refueled, refueled, but Cooper was starting to get a bit antsy. So 
Mr. Cooper Mm -hmm. had enough knowledge of the whole situation at this time that he knew about how long the refueling should take. This plane refueled at about 4,000 gallons per minute or something like that. And it should have been done in about five minutes. Yeah, so he was familiar. I don't know how long it would take to fill up an airplane. I would assume it would take hours because it's so big. Right? So, like, he knew that. Mm -hmm. And because they were taking so long, he apparently was getting, like you said, he was getting a little bit antsier, a little bit antsier, antsier to the point that, um, so normally when pilots take off, they have to submit it in flight, or no, um, a flight plan, which is just something to somewhere that tells them where we're going. Mr. Cooper was like, we're, I, no, this is taking up too much time. We are not submitting that. Just fly in this general direction and fly to Mexico City in some variation of that. With the cabin lights off, flaps at 15 degrees and the air stairs down. And the captain was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> One, so unsafe. <laughs> <laughs> One, we can't. We don't have the capacity to reach Mexico City. We would need to refuel somewhere. Um, And two, we cannot take off with the air stairs down. They then decided on a refueling stop in either, I believe, or from what information I saw, Cooper, I believe, or from what information I saw, Cooper suggested either Phoenix, Yuma, or Sacramento. And somehow they agreed on Reno. The flight took to the air again around 7.40 p.m., with only the remaining crew on board with Cooper. Cooper had also said, asked, or requested that the flight go as slow as possible, as low as possible. So, I heard that he had specific, like, numbers. Yes! He requested them stay under 10,000 feet, Mm -hmm. which is actually a normal skydiving range. Yes! And go, um, and stay below 150 knots, which... So normal skydiving for civilians is at like 90 knots, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but trained professionals uh, are trained, um, like military professionals skydive at around like 120 to 130. Wow. So it's feasible that he could skydive at this. Mm -hmm. It's possible. Mm -hmm. This is also like the slowest that the plane landing out of the sky at the, at, because the air, because of the air. It's like the air is denser when you're lower. So you need to go faster, you need to stay at a certain speed in order to push enough dense air to get somewhere. Okay. This is the plane crash documentaries. (laughs) (laughs) So they were flying southeast towards Mexico City, and unbeknownst to them, they were followed by three jets. Dun dun. Dun dun dun. (laughs) This is like more of a dun 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 moment than it actually is, Mm because they actually couldn't see anything Anything. happening, because it was a dark and stormy as night. It was rainy and cold, but not freezing. There are also um, fighter jets. Yeah, like they could have shot it down at any moment. Yeah, they're yeah. like legit, like fancy jets. Yeah. Um, I'm sure they had night vision on them, just because. I mean, I'm sure they had all sorts of vision on them, just yeah. because. I can't imagine that they didn't. Yeah, whatever happened in the 70s. And somehow, they all failed. I mean, I'm sure they had all sorts of vision on them, just yeah. because. I can't imagine that they didn't. Yeah, whatever happened in the 70s. And somehow... They all failed. <gasps> Did you hear about the red vision thing? I just saw this and I don't know if it's real or not, but I saw it on YouTube shorts. It was like at some point in the Vietnam War, which I think was around this time, instead of night vision, they had something called red vision goggles, which people were like, soldiers were losing their minds and like saying, I'm seeing like the devil or like devilish things and like really scary stuff was happening. So they eventually took that out of circulation and was like, we're not using that. And eventually it came to light that the people that like saw things were not going crazy because there was a chemical in these goggles that was leaking and making them hallucinate. Ew. So like there was, there was like really, there's some really bad things that happened when they're supposed to be stealthy and someone just like loses their mind and like starts shooting or like screaming because they see something. They're seeing something, but there's nothing there. Take off is when he finally put on his famous Stevie Cooper dark sunglasses. Wow. He was finally ready to hide his identity after being <laughs> seen by 42 passengers. That is really a good call. hmm <laughs> So at this point, after takeoff, he asked Tina to lower the staircase, but she was scared that she'd be sucked out of the plane if she did so. And he was not concerned about this. He knew that was not about to happen as the plane was flying low enough that there wouldn't be much change in pressure, especially because he had asked the cabin to remain unpressurized. 
Because the captain was like, no, we will not take off with the Airstairs Town. He was like, okay, well then in that case, I would like someone to show me how to use, how to lower the air stairs while we're in flight. And then I have that, this person, which was Tina, that she showed him and then he ordered her to go back to the cabin. So yeah, Cooper ordered her to go to the cockpit, assuring her that he'd either take the bomb that this person, which was Tina, that she showed him and then he ordered her to go back to the cabin. So yeah, Cooper ordered her to go to the cockpit, assuring her that he'd either take the bomb or disarm it. She asked him to. She was Mm, like, please don't leave us on board. Mm -hmm. Reasonable. Mm -hmm. And she was the last person to see D.B. Cooper and left him tying something to his waist, assuming the parachute bag that he had filled with the money. Okay, so after Tina went to the cockpit, she was told not to emerge until after the flight or something like that. So she went to the cockpit and locked the door Mm -hmm. and they all just sort of waited. They had talked to him about something via the phone line at around 8.05, which was their last communication with him, and then they felt the plane do a little something, in which they assumed was the air stair opening, um, about 10 minutes later. Okay. And then I have that they did not go back out to check until they landed. I think that part's corroborated with they, would, they were trying to get a hold of the back to see if they could close the door. Mm-hmm. Meaning they were bringing the phone back there to see... I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's not like he would tell them that he... No, oh, yeah, sure, just go right ahead. I don't know what they were doing, but... And when they were getting closer to landing... This is... When they were getting closer to landing, that's when they had this conversation with air traffic control or someone like that. <laughs> okay. Um, they were like, yeah, we can't get a hold of the back. And they mentioned something along the lines of... We can't get a hold of the, of the back, and we don't want to close the door just in case he's there, or something like that. I have Yeah, gets angry and blows up the plane. Yeah. This was a little bit later, when they were preparing to land. They'd mentioned, we can't seem to raise the back there. If he is there, we kind of hate to. We just as soon land with a thing hanging down. Yeah. Probably, like you said, because if they did close it, or try to close it, did, it's and they did successfully. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also interesting, because of, like, the the air stairs don't, like, fully come down. They only go down, like, a couple inches or something like that. So, like, they wouldn't have opened enough for Cooper to just, like, he couldn't have even, like, squeezed out of it, if that makes sense. Really? If he wasn't putting his weight on it. So because he put his weight on it, that was enough to lower the stairs. Okay. But if there was no weight on them, they don't. They just maybe barely open enough for him to squeeze out with a parachute. Interesting. So like they, they're. It's not like it's hanging like fully open. Right. Certainly is when they get further into landing. <laughs> yeah. But. Because <laughs> I had that they saw that the stairs had opened and then they felt the the dip up like fifteen minutes later. And I was so confused, and I heard lots of people being confused mm. as to why him jumping out of the airplane would have caused such a change, like this, like, 150-pound man, you know? It's because the pressure... Lots of people being confused mm. as to why him jumping out of the airplane would have caused such a change, like this, like, 150-pound man, you know? It's because the pressure of him opened the staircase. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. And Crazy. so uh, there's animations of him just sort of walking down and then going, wait, but <laughs> in theory... <laughs> Wait. <laughs> well, literally he is. <laughs> In theory, it would have made more sense if he actually walked backwards down the stairs and then just sort of ew fell back. Yeah. Ooh, gross. Scary. Because otherwise there might have been too much force and it, it just would have made more sense theoretically for him to be walking backwards. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, well, like you said, the crew the crew remained in the cockpit until they landed, upon which the plane was searched and no sign of the hijacker was found, except for some evidence, and in, we will talk about that coming right up. Um, shall we talk about the- I do want to say at this point that there was a typo in mm. a news story, which is why we have D.B. Cooper and not Dan Cooper. Mm-hmm. Throughout all of this- he was going by Dan Cooper. That's how he, like, signed up for his plane ticket. That's what he, like, introduced himself to the flight attendants as Dan Cooper, not D.B. Cooper. So mm-hmm. somewhere along the lines, things got mixed up, and now he's known as D.B. Cooper. Mm-hmm. There was actually a D.B. Cooper suspect, which some people are kind of wondering, is that where the confusion came from? Like, the news people just accidentally took D.B. Cooper 
instead of Dan Cooper because that's the name that they were talking about that day and we're like, oh, obviously this is the guy. Like this is the guy's name, not this is the actual, this is a human being that's a suspect. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. That could have been how it got confused, but genuinely no one knows. Apparently not even the FBI. Which but is it's so stuck. interesting. Yes. Like he used a fake name and then it got even fake. Which but is it's so stuck. interesting. Yes. Like he used a fake name and then it got even faker and he probably was like, what a win. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> got an extra letter. <laughs> <laughs> they won't find me now. <laughs> Spoiler alert, they don't. Crazy. Oh my gosh. This hijacking became known as Norjack. Northwest hijacking. Yes. Yes. So when I say Norjack from here on out, that's what I'm referring to. So during the ensuing investigation, the plane was searched for evidence. They found Cooper's black clip-on tie with a small little hair of DNA. Which is also so funny that it was like a clip-on and not like a real tie. It's kind of iconic. (laughs) Um, They also found a tie clip cigarette butts, which later went missing. I have thoughts on that. And two of the parachutes that were still left on the plane. He only took two parachutes, one of which he tied around his waist and left the other two. Mm -hmm. Interestingly interestingly enough, possibly, this is possible information, it's not confirmed, he might have actually taken one of the military parachutes. Right, because they sourced the parachutes from different places. They weren't all from the same place. Yes. And I believe it was a civilian training facility, like civilian skydiving training facility that was nearby that they took the civilian shoots from. And I think it's that shoot that he took, one of those shoots from them, that actually was a fake shoot. It was just a dummy shoot. Like it did not open. And also someone had said, which I found really interesting. So there's like, a main parachute and then a reserved parachute and he took the two like typically reserved parachutes like the two last resort parachutes instead of either the two main parachutes or one main and one reserved which was a choice (laughs) one reserved which was a choice a choice (laughs) he took the two like ones that you don't necessarily want to have to use yes so this kind of leads investigators (laughs) to almost believe that maybe he wasn't very experienced. Right, which is so strange because up until this moment, up until the parachute moment that he picked the parachutes, it all seems like so well thought out and like perfectly executed. Yeah. Like literally perfectly executed. And then this was like the one moment that was like, oh, why would he do that? (laughs) Yeah. He was so meticulous about like certain things. And then other things he seemed to sort of overlook, like the sunglasses that he didn't put on until halfway through. Yes, that's actually a really good point. I didn't think about that one. He was meticulous enough to request that he was able to take the notes that he had handed to the flight attendants. Mm -hmm. He didn't leave those behind. He took to the flight attendants. Mm -hmm. He didn't leave those behind. He took them with him Mm -hmm. um, so as not to leave evidence. But then he left the cigarette butts, which contained DNA, which of course wasn't really a thing in the 70s, but still. True. As well as he left his clip-on tie. Like, he just left that there. So it's like, how was he so (laughs) meticulous about some things and so not about other things? That's fair. And about the parachutes, I almost wonder if he requested civilian parachutes because he thought that would be easier to source. But maybe he could have gone either way. He could have been just as fine with a military one. But that doesn't explain why he took a dummy shoot. I don't think he. Uh, I don't think he knew that it was a dummy shoot. Yeah. Cause also, let's be real here. The man jumped or like exited an air stair on a plane at night in the rain. <laughs> yeah, and with cloud cover, like he couldn't. It's theorized that he couldn't see very much. So I would kind of assume that at this point he's kind of. I mean, or like going like really fast, right? And um, right before Tina left him in the plane. When she had asked him to please, like, take the bomb. (laughs) He didn't really respond. Like, he didn't even act like he heard what she said. And she just kind of walked away. So that kind of makes me believe that maybe he was maybe, like, a little bit, like... (laughs) Freaking out? Yeah, like, his brain just could not pick up on the idea that this was a dummy shoot. Also, why would he assume? (laughs) Like, I don't even... If the purpose that he picked, like, asked for four parachutes two sets of parachutes 
was to can like make the investigators think or the FBI or whoever make the authoritative people think that he was taking a hostage he would really have any reason to believe that they would give him like any sort of affected parachute yeah they claimed it was by mistake <laughs> of course <laughs> They gathered eyewitness testimony, and a composite sketch was made. I'm pr- yeah, they claimed it was by mistake. <laughs> of course. <laughs> they gathered eyewitness testimony, and a composite sketch was made. I'm pretty sure Tina was, like, integral in this part of this process, because she had spent the most time with him. Yeah. She looked at his face the most. Yes. There were three official sketches of Cooper Dunn, the last one being the closest likeness, according to Tina and Florence Schaffner. He was described as around 5 foot 10 inches, 175-ish pounds, mid-40s, short black hair, and olive skin. Someone described him also as not anyone that was involved in the situation, but like a third party. Described him as someone that you probably wouldn't pay too much attention to if you saw in passing. Yeah. Which is fair. Yeah, he just looks like an average guy, and he was like average height, average build. Average. He was just like... If somebody was going to get away with something like this, it was going to be this guy. (laughs) You know? (laughs) They didn't didn't see see anything. They didn't see him jump out. They didn't see... They didn't see anything. No. (laughs) Because it was a dark and stormy-ish night. Yeah. And it wasn't, like, crazy stormy, but it was, like, rainy. Yeah. It said that, like, any experienced parachutist wouldn't have done this. It leads um, the FBI to wonder, and investigators to wonder, whether he did it for the money or if he did it for the thrill. Mm. And I kind of wonder that too, because he wasn't seemingly too concerned about the money. He tried to give it away. <laughs> he like strapped it with a parachute. He didn't like force the knapsack issue. <laughs> like it's just weird. He seemed a little bit careless with the money. Two hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money, especially back then. But he could have asked for more. Mm-hmm. It seems like a, almost a weirdly specific number. Agreed. And a weirdly low number. Like to have for for me specifically to have to live the rest of my life in fear, I don't know that that much money would be a specific number. Agreed. And a weirdly low number. Like, to have, for for me specifically, to have to live the rest of my life in fear, I don't know that that much money would be enough. That's a good point. I'm actually going to Google how much it would be today. 1.5 million. Oh, you've already Googled it. I mean, 1.5 is like... It's a lot of money. It's a good amount of money. But he's not going to... I mean, he must have known that he's not going to be able to spend it, theoretically. That's true. Because they would have, you know, noted down the numbers of the bills and stuff. And there are ways that that can slip through the cracks, but Mm -hmm. still. And they did. They categorically, I believe, photographed every single bill that they gave him. And they also made sure that all the bills started with the letter L. Yeah. I've heard conflicting reports as to whether or not they think that Cooper was skilled, like a skilled parachutist, or whether he was military or whether he was just some guy. Like, there seems to be a lot of conflicting things about that because oh, that, you know? Yes, that's what I was thinking too. Like, he had to have known someone or had known himself. Yeah. Like, experienced himself. Yeah. Does that make sense? He either had to know someone experienced or had the experience himself. Yeah, that makes exactly. Sense. <laughs> um, also, because of the fact that he was seeming to be in his 40s, he was kind of out of the range of the average civilian parachute or a skydiver as a hobby oh he was okay. a little older than that that's fair hobby not that Normally. he couldn't have done it you know no but average yeah. age like my mom's in her 50s and she still did judo and like stuff like that <laughs> she would probably jump out of an airplane now i love her oh she's so cool hi mom hi <laughs> <laughs> it's also interesting to note how intelligent he was like, his demeanor with people was not that of somebody who was rough around the edges, you know? He was polished. He was, he so was polished. calm, he was polished, and it was also said that he used... Was not that of somebody who was rough around the edges, you know? He was polished. He was, he so was polished. calm, he was polished, and it was also said that he used intelligent words, mm-hmm. not just common speech. <laughs> <laughs> And he is on an airplane. That's true. That's fancy. (laughs) So this intelligence may have made it that he would not have wanted an accomplice or needed one. And it's also interesting because when they changed his flight path, he didn't have a specific flight path in mind. He just said, fly southeast towards Mexico City and didn't seem to like 
like if he had an accomplice on the ground is what I'm saying, they would have needed to have a meetup point and it didn't seem like that was a concern for him. And they didn't have cell phones. There would have been no easy way for him to get in touch with said accomplice. Accomplice. <laughs> Once he'd landed wherever, he'd have to walk somewhere. Mm-hmm. My thought is maybe there was flares. They were flares, not dynamite. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. Yes, because I will say at this point also the FBI believes that oops, the FBI believes that the bomb was not real. Yes. Yeah. Another theory I'd heard about that is it's quarters. It's a roll of quarters and red duct tape. Oh, wow. I yeah. didn't hear about that, but that's bold. Yep. Specifically so that when he got to the ground, he could go to a um, payphone and use the quarters to pay, or yeah, to call his accomplice or someone to come and get him. Interesting. I don't know that I necessarily believe that, but it's a theory. His choice of the Boeing 727 was an interesting one, as it was unique in that the stairs could be open mid-flight. That's interesting. So he must have known something about the plane in order to have chosen the specific plane, or he just got lucky, but... I feel like it's unlucky. Or unlikely. Whoa. <laughs> it's unlikely that he just got lucky. Yeah, because it's like, I would could not, or the stairs could not be lowered mid-flight. That's terrifying to just be a passenger going, oh, I wonder if these stairs could just be lowered right now. Also, I'm not sure if you've heard this, but secretly, around the same time, the CIA was actually using this plane to covertly drop um, agents in the Vietnam War. Wow. It was a secret. Very few people apparently knew about. That's interesting. So that leads more credence to the idea that he could have been part of the military. Mm -hmm. And also because he knew where the military base was. Mm -hmm. Crazy. I know. I will say D.B. Cooper was not wearing any sort of survival gear that they could tell. He was wearing a business suit. Yes, and it was, like, November yeah. at this time. So yes. it was not summer. <laughs> no, it was cold. He was also just wearing, like, regular... I think them, they called them loafers. Yeah. Like, regular shoes. Wearing, like, regular... I think them, they called them loafers. Yeah. Like, regular shoes. Yeah. Not trekking anything. Nothing about him was saying, I'm going to trek in the wilderness. Exactly. And, um... <sighs> The bag that he carried, obviously there was nothing in the briefcase, but he did have the paper bag, which right. maybe nobody knows what was in it. So it could have maybe carried some survival mm. gear. Like jumping out of an airplane, you're going to need some goggles, you know, or like gloves, maybe some boots or a helmet. Fair enough. Yeah. You're going to need some things jumping out of an airplane that he didn't have, right. which is interesting. So maybe that was in the paper bag because we don't know mm. what was in the paper bag. That would, I would hope that's what's in the paper bag. Originally, I just assumed it was alcohol for some reason. Interesting. I don't know why. I mean, that makes sense. I feel like that's just what you I would expect normally. In a paper bag? Yeah. It's either a child's lunch or a bottle of whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How would, so he would have stuffed, no, he would have used the items in the paper bag. Whatever he didn't use, he would have stuffed it along with the money, probably. Yeah, or just tossed it out of an airplane. Well, how, he would have, how would he have found it after? right <laughs> that would be unless he like just held it and jumped out of an airplane but i don't think you can really do that well see that was another thing so feasibly he couldn't have just held on to the money because it was heavy enough and big enough that it would he just could not have held on to it mm. by himself so that's why he had most likely strapped it on himself yeah so like we don't it's just, <laughs> it infuriates me that we don't know what was in this paper bag and i want to know and i assume it must have been some sort of survival gear but I don't it must have been it must have been yeah. Unless it was a real bomb. <gasps> <laughs> Let's talk about the actual investigation. After okay. they searched the plane, what happened? They couldn't really narrow down too much where he could have landed as they don't know exactly when he jumped and the jets behind, like we said, couldn't jumped and the jets behind, like we said, couldn't see him. And any number of things could have gone wrong, like injury upon landing, exposure to the elements, or even him just getting lost in the wilderness. Although it wasn't freezing, it would have been uncomfortable. Yeah. The FBI even retraced the flight path in an attempt to find any sign of him with no avail, no luck. <laughs> Shoot, that's shocking. <laughs> and the most they could narrow it down was an area around the south of Mount St. Helens in Washington near the Washougal River. And it's interesting because when I think, or when I thought before of D.B. Cooper jumping out of an airplane, I thought he lands in the middle of the wilderness in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. But apparently he could have landed just as easily if he landed in this area, he could have landed just as easily in someone's backyard. That is crazy. Isn't that insane? So it's like, 
he mm. maybe didn't need to have survival gear because he could have just like walked to a road and hitchhiked a ride. Yeah. But he couldn't have known that because he wouldn't have no. been able to see the ground was found. And it's interesting that it was in the Mount St. Helens area because mm-hmm. when it erupted, it could have possibly buried some of the evidence. So the investigation was suspended in July of 2016, and Norjack remains the only unsolved case of commercial airline piracy. So the evidence that they collected from the plane was inspected, the clip-on tie, the tie clip, the cigarette butts, and the cigarette butts did eventually go missing, so we don't really have a lot of DNA. The only real piece of DNA that they, we have is the tiny particles of hair that was on the tie. Yeah. Which might not even be his. That's very disappointing. It's very disappointing. So we don't know whether this hair is his, so it's not even like conclusive that we could test this for DNA and trace back, like mm-hmm. they've done for certain cases nowadays. But they did also find unalloyed titanium on this tie. Yes. Yes. And this unalloyed titanium is rare. It was not really used on a lot of things, but it was used in Boeing manufacturers. And it is an essential part of the operations that isn't commonly used in un- other industries, except for like Boeing and railways. Yes. <laughs> which we'll talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so because Cooper was so knowledgeable about this specific airplane, it's possible that he could have worked for Boeing or been a pilot himself because he did know so much about that specifically. I mean, how would you know about airspeeds and not like, yeah, no, airspeeds and um, height without specific knowledge. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, like, nowadays you can find almost anything on the internet. Well, that's true. (laughs) But, like, back then you couldn't. No. Back then you had to, like, know people or just know things. Yeah. In February 1980, eight-year-old Brian Ingram found a bundle of cash equaling three separate bags, I believe. But it was still in, like, the bundle. It still had, like, the um, rubber band around it. So it was in three bundles in one bag. Am I understanding? I'm not sure, but I know it did have the rubber attached to it. I I know, I think. Um, Okay. So the money washed ashore the Columbia River about nine miles or 14 kilometers downstream from Vancouver, Washington. And the bills were borderline disintegrated, but the FBI was able to confirm that this was indeed part of the ransom money. And they were able to determine through the state of the paper and the rubber bands that still surrounded it that the money would have had to enter the water months after the hijacking took place. I think due to the algae in the water, there's like algae blooms around spring. Mm. And this like, this the, these bills had the algae bloom on it, which they would have only been able to have after the hijacking. Because they wouldn't have been able to be in the water for that long without being disinterred on it, which they would have only been able to have after the hijacking. Interesting. Because they wouldn't have been able to be in the water for that long without being disintegrated. So they must have entered sometime in the spring, not in fall, like right after the hijacking. I think there was also, they'd done some like moving of sand and stuff into, I want to say, I can't Google it now because nothing's coming up, obviously. That's just always how it happens. <laughs> I think the area was called like Tina Bay. Tina Bar? Yes, thank yeah. you, Tina Bar. So this, they, yeah, they'd move sand from elsewhere to this bar at some point mm-hmm. in the past few years. I believe the way that they found it, it was determined that it wasn't likely that it came from the sand elsewhere. And it was, like you said, along with the sediments that were found on it, they would have had to have been placed there, not moved there, based on what all of that stuff. And he got ripped away from him. How would it have landed there, like, nine years later? Yeah. Have you looked after? at the flight path? Like, no. Because it's pretty far. It's not likely that the money would have just blown out of the plane when he jumped or traveled downstream from where he approximately landed because the stream actually went the opposite direction. So, like, it couldn't have just traveled there on its own. It it leads to the idea that it was specifically placed there for some reason. Right. Also, did we mention that these bills matched bills that were given to Cooper? Like, these are confirmed bills. Yeah. Yeah. The FBI did confirm that they were the actual part of the ransom. And this is, like, there's no, we don't know where the rest of the money is still, Mm -mm. or how or why it was separated. 
And to this day, the rest of it has not been found. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they did, they like used submarines and radar to search the that river. Why it was separated, and to this day, the rest of it has not been found. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they did, they like used submarines and radar to search the that river and maybe dredged it also. Yeah. Like they did search for it in that spot and they didn't come up with anything else. It's so weird. And it was shallow enough that like this kid playing in the sand found it. Wasn't I thought he was digging something. I well, thought yeah. he was like digging. But he wasn't like digging like a f- grave. He was just digging in the sand to like, I... make a sand castle. Wasn't I thought he was digging for like a shelter or like something. He's 8, isn't he? He's 8. He wouldn't be digging for a shelter. I mean, That's dumb. Maybe, but there's only so much an 8-year-old can do, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. He's kind of limited. <laughs> yeah. Um, he did end up selling the bills at auction and making, like, a ton of money from it. <gasps> oh, so good, good for him. him. Oh, yeah. wait, the FBI didn't, like, take it back? They took some of it and let oh. him keep the rest. Aw. Yeah. That's sweet, actually. Yeah, so that's kind of cool. Hmm. If you're a collector, <laughs> I'd love to hear from you. Honestly. <laughs> In 2008, 15 of the $20 bills sold for more than $37,000. He made bank. Good oh for him. Oh my gosh. I don't know if this is from him, because this was not This was 2008. Oh. But. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. The FBI did publicly state that Cooper had probably died during doing this. Like, mm-hmm. he had jumped out of an airplane, fallen, died, but no body was ever found, mm-hmm. which is interesting. One of the lead investigators at some point did put his like, favor towards the idea that he's still alive. Yeah. Just because after so many years, they found nothing. Yes. Um, except for the money, which shows that someone put it there. It is speculated that perhaps the FBI only claimed that he... They believe that... Shows that someone put it there. It is speculated that perhaps the FBI only claimed that he... They believe that he had died so as to discourage future hijackings. That mm. they actually do believe that he's was still alive. Mm-hmm. If he was still alive, though, he would be, like, well into his 90s now. Yeah. So he's yeah. probably, if he was alive, he probably isn't anymore. No. I mean, I hope he lived a good life mm-hmm. after this. He didn't hurt anyone, technically. No. It was not a great choice. No. Do not do this, ever. Don't. Anyone. But he won't get away with it now, I no. promise you. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> couldn't even get on a plane with like a little bit of water honestly <laughs> <laughs> so there have been countless suspects but none are particularly of interest like there has been so many and there's so many because of the infamous nature of this case there have been a ton of people cl- and a ton of people saying oh i think my brother or my uncle or my husband is db cooper yeah yeah there were also a couple people back when this happened shortly after who sold stories to the tabloids that they themselves were D.B. Cooper. Right. They were arrested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't claim to be a criminal. They didn't get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> While hijackings weren't really such a thing before this, there were 15 similar ones in the year following D.B. Cooper. Mm-hmm. But none were successful and all were caught. Mm-hmm. So going into the suspects, I have a few that I would like to talk about because I think... They are the most interesting and most credible, as well as I searched through the Reddit to see what the general consensus of was. <laughs> Smart. Of people who, like, are more into this case than I could possibly be ever. <laughs> it would take, like, generally, genuinely, like, years yeah. to know all of the information. Yes. There's pe- so, so much. People devote, like, their lives to this. Mm-hmm. We only had, like, a month. People devote, like, their lives to this. Mm-hmm. We only had, like, a month to research. <laughs> <laughs> um... We don't know how, how Cooper got to the airport. His car has not been found. We don't know, like, if somebody dropped him off or if he walked, if he took, like, a public bus system. Nobody knows. There also have been no missing persons reports of anyone matching his description. Right. So it's like, maybe he did survive. Because nobody, like, reported him missing. It's like he either survived or, like, ended anyone that would have known him. Oh. Or, like, cared that he wasn't there. Oh, goodness. <laughs> but it, he doesn't, it doesn't feel like he has the demeanor to do that. It doesn't strike me as that kind of person. But also, he could have just been from a different state. We don't know. Like, oh, that's true. Oh, that's... Maybe, ooh. Yeah. Mm. Maybe he flew in from Texas and then boarded a plane. Or, like, Canada. Yes. <laughs> I have opinions about that one. 
Um, so let's talk about a similar hijacking to D.B. Cooper. Um, very which, similar. Yes, very similar, which was conducted by a man, man named Richard McCoy. On April 7th of 1971, so just a few months after Cooper, he boarded a Boeing 727 headed to Los Angeles, California from Newark, New Jersey, going by the alias James Johnson. Not as cool. No. (laughs) So, he was armed with a pistol and a hand grenade and demanded (laughs) $500,000. Brazen. Brazen. Very brazen. You're right. Um, In the middle of the flight, he did the same thing that Cooper did and jumped from the stairs in the back. I believe that he... He was caught two days later, following a tip from a man who had actually given him a ride right after and noticed a jumpsuit and duffel bag. Wow. Casual. Casual. He protested innocence, but the FBI FBI found the money and the jumpsuit in his house. I'm pretty sure he also left, like, copious, left, like, copious amounts of evidence on the plane. His fingerprints were everywhere. He left the notes, because he had also given notes, more than one note, I believe. To the flight attendants, and he left them with the flight attendants. Yeah, and he was nervous, visibly nervous. Yes. I heard that he started off calm and collected, similar to Cooper, and then shortly afterwards got visibly nervous and started like making mistakes. Right. I don't think he was very old either at he the time. He was only like 28. Yeah. I think. So he was quite a bit younger than Cooper. Mm-hmm. So he was sentenced to 45 years, but escaped prison shortly after by stealing a garbage truck with a couple of other prisoners. Wild. Wild. (laughs) And the others were caught just a few days later, but McCoy made it a whole three months before he was found and eventually killed in a shootout with authorities. And eventually killed in a shootout with authorities. So Richard McCoy could be D.V. Cooper, but there's a few reasons as to why it's almost definitely not him. Mm. Specifically, you know, he was nervous. He made a lot more mistakes. He was quite a bit younger than Cooper. He also didn't look like him. He also spoke with a southern accent and was not polished like D.B. Cooper was. Ah. But still, he has not been entirely ruled out as a suspect. I'm pretty sure one of the um, police... Was either the policeman that shot him or one of the policemen involved said something along the lines of, when I killed him i killed cooper yes which is quite a statement it's bold yeah and i don't know whether he said that metaphorically like he killed him and in his mind he was also putting away the db cooper case <laughs> i don't understand it but there's I, a lot of levels i disagree that he was db cooper i don't see cooper for the record hmm. the next one i will talk about is william j smith so hmm. he was named as a suspect in 2018 He would have been 43 at the time of the hijacking, so in the right age range, and he did have a motive, as he had recently lost his pension because the railroad he worked at had gone bankrupt. The the, um, unalloyed titanium that they found on the tie could have come from a railroad, which also leads further credence to the idea that he could have been D.B. Cooper. Mm -hmm. He was also a veteran, so he would have had knowledge of parachutes and stuff, and and, um, he looked a ton like Cooper. There's one specific drawing that they did of him, of Cooper, aged. Mm -hmm. And at that age, Smith looks very similar to the drawing. Yeah. Yeah. That's is why I have him written down. If you Google this guy, he looks exactly like him. Mm -hmm. It's uncanny. He also had a friend named Daniel exactly like him. Mm -hmm. It's uncanny. He also had a friend named Daniel Cooper who had passed during the war, so this could be where the alias came from. I I was mostly interested in him as a suspect because he looks so much like Cooper. Yeah. It's, like, really weird. Google it, I swear. (laughs) One of the other suspects is a man named Robert Rackstraw, and this Hmm. guy is the focus of the documentary that was on Netflix. A man named Tom Colbert, I believe is how you say his name, really is the one who is, like, leading the charge that this man specifically is D.B. Cooper. Did he write a book? He, I believe so. Okay. I disagree. I don't <laughs> think he's D.B. Cooper. I did <laughs> watch the documentary. <laughs> Robert Rackstraw was only 28 at the time of the hijacking, so quite a bit younger. But also, it was 1971. Everybody drank and smoked back then. You were gonna... I don't know that he looks enough like Cooper. Okay. 
Um, Robert Rackstraw also served on an army helicopter crew during the Vietnam War, so he would have known how to use a parachute. So, Robert Rackstraw was a bit of a shady guy. He was nope. arrested for possession of explosives and check fraud. Yes. So, he does have a criminal background. He did make bail and then attempted to fake his own death by radioing air traffic control con- and telling them that he was jumping out of a rented airplane. <laughs> so, then he was arrested again for forging pilot credentials. Wow. Going well. <laughs> Going so well. He also did at some point claim that he was D.B. Cooper or oh. not not claim so there's like videos of him as a young man and he's like i mean i might have been db cooper who's to say i wasn't he did say things like that and then got a lot of media attention Mm. and he was wasn't he did say things like that and then got a lot of media attention Mm. and he was in the documentary not as like a talking head but more as a they were following him around with cameras and trying to get him to talk to him. Interesting. It was a choice. It was <laughs> okay. a choice. Um, huh. That doesn't seem very... That doesn't seem no. beneficial. No. So, he could be D.B. Cooper, but I'm going to say he's not. Moving on. <laughs> the newest suspect is Vincent Peterson. And a man named Eric Ulis has been investigating this case for over a decade. He's the one who named this guy as a suspect. Okay. So while Peterson has passed away, he would have been 52 at the time of the hijacking. So a little bit older, but... In the range. In the range. And he was an engineer at a titanium plant that oh. was a subcontractor for Boeing. Oh! Um, the titanium particles on the time match say that Peterson matched the description and that he would occasionally travel with him to Seattle for work. So he not only hmm. would have been familiar with Boeing, he would have been familiar with this flight path. Wow. That's a little suspicious. It's a little suspicious. <laughs> so that's the newest suspect. Okay. Wow. So now we are on to my last suspect. This was t- this idea was taught told to me by someone that I know who's oh. pretty sure that this guy is DB Cooper and he knows the case because he lived in the town that this guy was from. My inside scoop, if you will call him, he watched. Uh, I think it was like an unsolved mystery or something like that. One of those popular shows where Mm. they talk about mysteries. Yeah. And this man was talked about, not as a D.B. Cooper suspect, but for a different reason, which I will tell you about right now. Okay. So there was a guy who lived in Cranbrook, which is a B.C. town that is right across the border from Washington. Now, this man was named Alex 1887. He was last seen paying for his lunch with a wad of cash. Oh. (laughs) And when his wife tried to find his birth certificate to give to the authorities, she discovered that Alex Cooper didn't legally exist until their marriage in 1952. And then, in 1991, a man named David Cooper was reported missing in Toronto. The police found photos of Alex slash David, and they connected the dots. Apparently, he had tried to return home and his landlady told him about the police, so he vanished again before they tracked him down in 1992. Okay, wait, so he was Alex. Alex and David are the same person. Alex and David are the same person. <gasps> oh, no. Oh, my goodness. So he disappeared again and showed up in 1992. They questioned him. The authorities questioned him, like, why do you keep disappearing? <laughs> like, are you on the run? Because we don't know what crime we could get you for. <laughs> and he admitted that his name was actually Albin Arsene Arsenault. Which is question him, like, why do you keep disappearing? <laughs> like, are you on the run? Because we don't know what crime we could get you for. <laughs> and he admitted that his name was actually Albin Arsene Arsenault, which is a name. Wow, that is a name. And in his youth, he was falsely accused of robbing an office in the <gasps> Union Pacific Railroad and went on the run to avoid being punished for a crime that he didn't do. Wow. Also, <laughs> falsely? <laughs> Are we sure? <laughs> I mean, he went on the run twice. So he changed his name and got married, but he had to submit his birth certificate his birth certificate to receive his pension. He obviously oh. didn't have one, so he decided to vanish. Oh. As you do. Of course. So he was reunited with his family after he was found and lived until 2007. And he is a suspect of the D.B. Cooper case because of his pension for just disappearing <laughs> randomly and going on the run to Lake Cooper and was associated with the railroad, which could have had the titanium. Dang. Also, he had a wad of cash. Where did he get the wad of cash from? I mean, yeah. yeah. Who had wads of cash back then? Who? Not many. No. <laughs> 
My last note for suspects, I will say, is that some people believe that D.B. Cooper is also the oh, Zodiac stop Killer. It. No! <laughs> no, no, I do not like this theory. Um, I got chills as soon as I saw the Zodiac Killer on there. Ugh. So some no. people... <laughs> So some people claim that the sketches look oh, alike. Oh, God. <laughs> they do. They do look alike. He has the I mean, same hairline and the same ears. Gross. It's the same also a mouth. police sketch. I don't know how <laughs> how accurate it is. But yeah, some people believe that he's a Zodiac, Zodiac killer. I don't believe this, but Ew. some people do. Well, that was unfortunate to hear. Accurate it is. But yeah, some people believe that he's a Zodiac, Zodiac killer. I don't believe this, but Ew. some people do. Well, that was unfortunate to hear. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Let's end with a fun theory. Oh, good. Was D.B. Cooper Canadian? I think possibly. Yeah. Because he could have gotten on a on a plane from Canada, ended up in... Seattle. Seattle. It's not that far from the border. It's really not. Like, it's like an hour away driving distance, which is a Canadian thing. We... We talk about driving distances in hours, okay? Apparently Americans don't do that. I don't know how to talk about it in any other form of time. No. Okay. Yeah. It's in about an hour ish. Yeah. So there's a few reasons for this. Specifically, he did this on Cana- on Thanksgiving weekend. American Thanksgiving weekend. Not Canadian. No. We have a different day. Yeah, we celebrate Thanksgiving in October. And Americans do it in November. So obligations to like Mm. go back to Mm -hmm. um but he also would have realized that the plane would probably be less populated on this day because of the american holiday surrounding it that makes sense family would have already like arrived yeah so it's also interesting that he asked specifically for american money which i don't know if an american would assume otherwise because why wouldn't they give it to him in american money agreed um, Although if I was a Canadian, like hijacking a, a Canadian plane, I'd probably ask for American money in Canada. You would ask for American money? It's worth more. The <laughs> Canadian money. <laughs> I guess that's why you did it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but that's interesting. It's so, not worth a lot more. It's it's like thirty cents on a dollar more. But I mean, it's a difference when you have like two hundred thousand dollars. It's gonna add up, right? That's true. <laughs> so. I'm thinking now, maybe he, so, (laughs) I'm thinking now, maybe he did that, then immediately, like, crossed the border as quick as possible and got the money switched over, so so as to get rid of it. In the FBI files that I skimmed, there was a lot of documents that mentioned Canada. Like, a ton. Really? There were letters from people... I mean, again, I didn't go through everything. But in what I saw, it felt like quite a few instances of people mentioning suspects that had moved to Canada or a letter saying that someone was now in Canada. Like, it's a lot. There was, it was surprising to me, the amount of times it was mentioned. Weird. Or that they, there was one, I don't even know. I don't know who the suspect is, okay? Because they redact so much, you (laughs) you can't even read any of it. But... This is um, a document of someone that they were interviewing where they were connected with this person and this person moved to Canada and then disappeared. And they couldn't find them again. They were trying to get them for for questioning and they just were gone, is my understanding of the document. Yeah, (laughs) because especially back in the 70s, there probably wouldn't have been as much communication Mm -hmm. between the U.S. and Canada. Mm -hmm. Also, no one was reported missing, Mm -hmm. but I don't know if they would have checked Canadian missing people. Probably or if they not. would have only I mean, they should them. have, but they probably didn't. <laughs> yeah. So if he did go missing in the wilderness and start a new life, they might not know about that. Mm-hmm. He also had no accent, which you might think mm-hmm. we have accents, but we don't. And mm-hmm. it might not be noticeable, especially like, I think um, Western Canada has less of an accent than Eastern Canada. That's true. Especially if he's just crossing the border to directly the state below. Western, the yeah. Western side. Yeah. Yeah. So... They might not have noticed if he had an accent. Literally, unless he said A. That's the only giveaway that we're from Canada, apparently. Even if you say the words, hey, people are like, or sorry. Oh, that's true. Or sorry. Oh my gosh. (laughs) The final note I I have on him being Canadian, and in general, is the comic book. So, The Adventures of Dan Cooper. Mm -hmm. It's a French comic book. Yes. It's a French comic book that wasn't really published widely in the States. 
Well, because, I mean, yeah. It's French. It makes sense. We're, <laughs> I don't know anything about anything. One of our national languages, I believe, is French. French, yes. We had to learn it in school. Yeah. We're, not that we live in Canada. Canadians we... have to learn French <laughs> in school. I think we've already pinpointed ourselves. Okay. <laughs> um, we do learn French. Most of us are not fluent. Like, <laughs> neither of us are. Um, However, even though we live in, like, more of a rural area, kind of, it's not a densely populated city, there are still, like, French immersion schools. There are. Near us. Yeah. There are, like, and every town, every or, yeah. like, every community every, yeah. has a French immersion school. And it's, like, popular enough that, like, I mean, we French immersion school. And it's, like, popular enough that, like, I mean, we could probably pick up a few words here and there, reading it or hearing it. I could not. Oh. <laughs> well, if we paid attention in school, like I didn't, we could maybe pick that up. And it's also, um, I think the far, further you get east towards Quebec, you probably would... The more... Yeah. 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 So if this man was from Canada, he could have very easily known French and read this book, The Adventures of Dan Cooper. And Dan Cooper in this book was like kind of a, a thrill seeker. He... And one of the books he specifically parachuted. He's an Air Force... He's an Air Force pilot? Or he's someone... He's in the military somehow, and I believe he's a pilot. But he's like a really cool hero pilot who does savior things. He seems very much like who D.B. Cooper was trying to emulate. Yes, I agree. They're just oddly specific. Yeah. Also, there was a lot of speculation about Tina Mucklow possibly being involved. Yeah. Just because she was so close, and it was just her and Cooper at the back of the plane for however many minutes while she taught him how to open the stairs. All the passengers were gone, the rest of the crew was in the front. And it's interesting that she had to, like, teach him. Yeah. I'm pretty sure this is, like, disproven. This has not gone anywhere. Okay. But there was a letter that I read that talks about Cooper having an accomplice. The letter is really obnoxious. <laughs> like, so obnoxiously written. Like, I don't know why I'm going on about this. Anyways, let's, like, that sort of stuff. Oh. I, so, um, this letter um, alludes to the idea that Cooper had an accomplice who was a red haired lady who was one of the passengers. The idea that Cooper had an accomplice who was a red haired lady who was one of the passengers on the plane. Interesting. Mm-hmm. And the letter also said something that apparently maybe was not out in the public's viewpoint at that time, which was something about... It was the fact that Cooper originally had asked to take off with the stairs down. Cooper didn't want the stairs pulled back up at all. He wanted, once they were down laying the passengers off, he wanted to just take off with them down. Which mm-hmm. leads to the idea that Cooper actually originally was planning on getting off the plane shortly after they departed the airport. And that fact wasn't, like, circulated yet. Interesting. It's oddly specific. And also, I feel like that makes sense. Which is, because why else would he ask to have the stairs down if he wasn't planning on doing it sooner than later? Yeah. Interesting. Mm Mm-hmm. So, I also feel like Cooper had an accomplice. I mean, the Zodiac Killer level. I feel like, honestly, when I was reading the letter, I was kind of like, it's very pompous. Almost the way that I feel like the Zodiac Killer wrote his first letter. Or like the acts of New Orleans person. Oh, yeah. Like they just wrote letters like, you don't need to know, but I know everything. And you're going to do what I say if you want the truth. And also, here's an opinion of mine. That doesn't matter. I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> now back to what we were talking about before. <laughs> like, huh. um... It's very attitude which doesn't feel like D.B. Cooper at all. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. The letter doesn't claim to be D.B. Cooper. They claim to be someone that knows this information, and they're not going to tell how they know the information. Okay, because they're lying. <laughs> <sighs> so annoying. Like, just why? I don't exactly know what I think, but I think Cooper wasn't alone. You think he had an accomplice? I do. I think somewhere, somehow, he had an accomplice, and I kind of just have... But I think Cooper wasn't alone think he had an accomplice i do i think somewhere somehow he had an accomplice and i kind of just have facts or not facts pardon me (laughs) ideas in my mind that don't make sense okay okay this is a fact okay (laughs) 
I'm quite positive that all of the passengers and crew were like disproven of having any involvement. Yeah, there's a lot of speculation that the entire flight crew was involved or that D.B. Cooper didn't exist at all. <gasps> That's so funny. I have not heard that, but that was my very first thought. Really? When thinking about this, yes, was huh. he felt like a scapegoat, like someone that wasn't actually real. Really? Yes. I don't know if that's true. I don't think it is. I don't I, believe that. I now <laughs> think that he's a real person. But when I was first really delving into this, I was like, this is just, almost I don't know. too perfect. Yeah. It's almost too much like a movie. There's an answer for all. Yeah. It's just, there's, I mean, we have a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of information that we're missing, obviously, but we also have a lot of very specific answers, mm -hmm. which just feels odd. Yeah. So Tina also, I'm pretty sure... Because she spent so much time with him, so many people thought that she was involved to the point that she just does not talk about it anymore. Because I don't know how, but citizens back then somehow just got where she lived and would like come to her house and be like, talk to me about this. Because they didn't believe that she had no involvement, which yeah. is really sad. People do that to the suspects too, which is crazy. <sighs> just leave them alone. I mean, it's not your place. No. Even if she was involved or they are D.B. Cooper, don't leave it alone. Yeah. It's not your place to know. No, you're, unless you're the police or specifically asked by someone in authority to do this. Which even then, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if the FBI asked me to investigate something, I probably would. A break <laughs> that I cut out for sure. <laughs> now we're back to talking about this we are. We're trying to regroup, so if we're a little disjointed, that's why. Final thoughts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Final thoughts. Yes, I definitely think somewhere along the line he had an accomplished accomplice why can't i say that word <laughs> an accomplice especially because of a few things <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um one being that the cigarette butts were lost two being that he may or may not have known that the cia was using these planes to drop humans into war secretly mm -hmm. which was not common knowledge right he either had to have experienced this information himself to know it or he was fed information which is kind and I kind of maybe feel like both equally they could have happened. But if he was fed information, that could explain to me why he chose the parachutes that he did and also was kind of like, yeah, I just fly in this direction. That could explain to me why he chose the parachutes that he did and also was kind of like, yeah, I just fly in this direction. Oh, this fueling point, sure. Right, like why he was a loosey goosey with some of the details further on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whereas before he was like, like we said earlier, so clear and precise. Hmm. Fly below this and below this speed. Hmm. And like we were talking about before, I did originally feel like it was just a hoax by the crew, <laughs> which I don't believe anymore. But I kind of wonder if there was someone on that plane that was somehow involved because they wouldn't have known. Why would they have suspected that? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh! Another interest, like another thing that he knew is he knew flight times. In addition to knowing everything else, he knew, like we talked before, he knew how long it would take to refuel this plane because fuel comes at this speed. It would take X amount of minutes to get from here to here in this flight. But he also didn't. It's weird because he knew that stuff, but then he didn't know that they would have needed a stop between there and Mexico City. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> it was like. It's weird because he knows some things so in detail that like nobody else would know mm -hmm. and then some things just like slip through the cracks mm -hmm. So that would make sense as he's being fed information mm -hmm. Exactly why he would be fed information. I'm not fully sure other than Some sort of like not for greed like we talked about before it wasn't wouldn't I don't think it would have been for the money but it would have had to do with something about tarnishing a reputation or ruining someone's career or bringing down a company or a bank or something like that. There is a theory that I have heard that perhaps this could have been staged by the airline so as to <sighs> increase security, like force increased security and staged by the airline so as to increase security, like force increased security and certain measures around the airport, which it did oh, do. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so that's like an idea. Maybe huh. that that could have been, and that would also be why the money was never found. He returned it to the airline. They gave him the same amount of money in different bills. Mm -hmm. Sorry, another point that I forgot to mention earlier 
one another reason why I think maybe he could have had an accomplice that or accomplice that was high up or was being fed information by someone high up is because and I mean someone with ties to certain investigative areas of this whole story is because I feel like the money was found at a very specific time. Okay. Like it feels like it was planted there. Like it didn't end up there naturally. Yeah. After he'd fallen out of the plane. <laughs> it just like, and it was put there somewhat recently. Hold on to it for that long. And yes. then put it there. Specifically, and my theory is because the investigators at the time were getting too close to discovering who it was. So to either throw them off the trail or like making them now allocate attention to this instead of what they were doing before here's some random money that matches in a different area that's not, that's just like a distraction. Yeah, it's like weird because it's not on the flight path. Mm -hmm. And it was not buried so deep that a child couldn't find it. Yes. Weird. There was also a theory that's um, just a random hiker found in the woods when he was hiking around there, the instructions on how to open the plane door or the airplane stairs, air stairs. But this, I think, was, like, a couple years later, and it was on a piece of paper, and I don't think the paper would have lasted that long. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> That's weird? Yeah. Okay, why would they have instructions? Yeah. Okay, why would they have instructions, first of all? <laughs> I know. Yeah, actually, why would they have written out instructions? It's not like they're going to have that posted on the wall of the airplane. No. And that's why Tina was there specifically to explain how to open. And it's not like she would have just been like, oh, I'm done talking to you. Here's a note. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After speaking to him the whole rest of the time. Yeah. Um, he could have had an accomplice. It could mm -hmm. have been somebody in the CIA specifically or the government or from the airline. I'm not saying the airline did any of what I said that they did. No, or any other, or the CIA or the government or the FBI. No, I don't personally believe that. <laughs> Unless I do, you will never know. <laughs> um, it's just a theory. All of these are just theories. Yeah. And then the other thing that struck me was in the FBI notes, it also says that the, the flight never squawked an emergency number. So on the um, control stations, you, stations, you squawk codes. <laughs> so my understanding <laughs> of it... Is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my understanding... It's like... On the screen will show a blip with a number, and I believe that usually it's a couple of numbers. Like it's your um, plane number, and then if you're having any sort of anything, you'll give, you'll squawk like a different code. So like if you're having um, an emergency on board, you'd squawk 77700, seven, seven, zero, I think, is what it said. <laughs> now you know. <laughs> if, if the flight attendants ever say that to each other, there's a problem. <laughs> Now's the time to panic. <laughs> Oh, someone opened a door. No. <laughs> Again, I couldn't, I could not find it, but it's written in the second part that they did not let the ground know that they were having a problem on board the plane until they were transferred to like air traffic control. So the first people that they spoke to, they weren't like bomber on this plane who's threatening to blow us up unless we do this and this. Because I couldn't find it. I don't know exactly what they said, but... They apparently didn't say anything. They just sort of said that they were going to land here and then were transferred over. And then they were like, we've got a problem. We need this and this and these demanding blah, blah, blah. I wonder what the reason would be. I don't know either. But then combine that with the idea that he didn't squawk anything. It was very concerning to me. <laughs> yeah. It's such a fun term, squawk. <laughs> That's interesting. I wonder if like they wanted to not alert or concern as many people as possible in the transcriptions when they were preparing to land this is the second time now they did say that they didn't want any um flashing lights around the runway right they didn't want like the police to show up with their sirens yeah firing. and i'm assuming that's because they weren't sure where he was yeah firing. and i'm assuming that's because they weren't sure where he was in the plane and if they had like landed and Cooper saw from the plane all these lights, he'd be like, mm. It would, might startle him and... And he might just, like, yeah, decide to just do it. Do the job. <laughs> right, do the job, which is yeah. what he kept saying. Yeah. So they did specifically mention that. However, um, I believe that the squawking 
is just to get the attention of some sort of ground control, like some sort of ground monitoring so that they would reach out to the plane and go, hey, uh, what's going on? <laughs> right, kind of like an SOS. Yeah, and then, and then they would better know how to direct them. They wouldn't just ignore them and only talk to them when they're entering a different space or coming too close to another aircraft or they need to change like their right their location kind of like calling 911 they'll yeah. walk you through it immediately as soon as i thought they'd be like oh what's going on right but they didn't do that and it, it's very i want to know why Me it's too. very clearly like an urgent situation yeah <laughs> unless the captain was like oh, this has happened before it's we're gonna be fine <laughs> <laughs> it's like there's no way that's a real bomb yeah <laughs> i was like really dan cooper i read those comics <laughs> what do you think happened i think that cooper survived <gasps> me too and i think probably that he did it mostly for the thrill and that the money is sitting in someone's or the rest of the money is sitting in someone's attic somewhere oh. and as to why the money was buried i think possibly he could have dropped some of it and then it like somehow ended up there like maybe somebody found it and then realized oh no this is db <laughs> cooper money and i'm a criminal this. i somehow ended up there like maybe somebody found it and then realized oh no this is db <laughs> cooper money and i'm a criminal this. i don't want this <laughs> yeah or maybe he gave it to someone and then they were like oh he's db cooper i need to get rid of this money i don't know but i do think that he survived i don't think that he's alive anymore because he'd yeah. be quite old. I don't think that he's any of the suspects that are currently named. Because I also agree with that. Yeah, none of them seem exact enough. Mm -hmm. Like there's little things, little details that make each one seem like they wouldn't have been DB Cooper. Yeah, there's enough. There's enough contradictions that you can like kind of rule them out. Yeah, I do like the theory that he was Canadian though. There's so much about this case that's just so weird. There's also so much about it that's, like, literally in Canada. To the point that it makes you believe that it's some Canada is included somehow. Like, yeah. they either fled to Canada or they were in Canada first. I, yeah. I really believe in the theory that he was Canadian. Norman Hijacker? Yeah, he was, like, so nice. And we have a reputation for being well. quite nice. <laughs> <laughs> At least back then. Yeah. I'm very into this case, and I'm f so frustrated that we don't know more. <laughs> As per usual. <laughs> As per usual. I just want to know. Like, who was he? I also really want to know why. Yeah, like, why? Was it for the money? Was it for the thrill? Was it really for a grudge? I want to know. Tell me. Tell me the truth. Baby <laughs> Cooper, if you're out there, reach out. <laughs> We'd love to interview you. We have things in mind at gmail.com. <laughs> if you think your relative or someone you know is D.B. Cooper, please reach out. Yeah. We would love to hear from you. We we don't have the listening bandwidth that maybe others who have dedicated their lives to D.B. Cooper do, but we are very interested. And we are so more than willing to entertain the crazy. <laughs> so in conclusion, who have dedicated their lives to D.B. Cooper do, but we are very interested. And we are so more than willing to entertain the crazy. <laughs> so in conclusion... To this day, the who, why, and where of D.B. Cooper remain unknown. Enthusiasts still speculate, some even devoting their entire lives to the search. While it's unlikely that he'll ever be found, many still hold out hope. And still others believe that they've cracked the case, adamant that one of the numerous suspects was a man responsible for Norjack. We may never know for sure, but we would absolutely, definitely like to hear your opinion. Yes. So please, reach out. We yes, are please. on all the socials, Weird Things and Wine. Or some variation thereof. You can find it on our website, weirdthingsandwine.com. <laughs> or send us an email at weirdthingsandwine at gmail.com. And while you're at it, you might as well just leave a review. We accept four and five stars. You have options. Thank you. Listening. Yeah. It's been a while. made it this far. It's been a while. Glad to be back. Glad to be back. We'll be back again soon with something interesting. Equally as interesting, we probably. Will. Something weird. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for listening. Yes, thank you. Till next time. Till next time. Stay weird. Drink wine. Cheers. Cheers. Stick around for some bloopers and outtakes. <laughs> we need a team of people.
We, we do. need a team of researchers. We do. Anyone want to apply for the not paid position? <laughs> it's an internship. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Have you seen a boot? A boot. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen or roof? Roof. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. I love like air mysteries. Mm. And I love sea mysteries. Foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> I love sea mysteries. Foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> Like, if it's not on land, I love it even more, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I agree. But I think he was driven to the airport by his wife, who was like, he was like, I'm going to hijack a plane. And she was like, do it. I dare you. (laughs) And so he did. Oh, that's actually really funny. (laughs) I love that he's wearing, like, sunglasses (laughs) in this exact photo. He's literally cosplaying as D.B. Cooper right now. Dang. He's literally (laughs) cosplaying. (laughs) Do yeah. they have cell phones at all? I don't no. think so. Yeah. So there would have... <laughs> there would have... <laughs> and the function could not be overrode from the cockpit. Sorry, my cat's yelling at me. <laughs>